It was May 1918 that a new friend and companion came into my life, a character, a personality, and a ringtail wonder. He weighed less than one pound when I discovered him, a furry ball of utter dependence and awakening curiosity, unweaned and defenseless. Wowser and I were immediately protected. We would have fought any boy or dog in town who sought to harm him. Sterling North was in his mid-fifties when he sat down at his well-used royal typewriter to begin the story of a remarkable year in his life, 44 years past. The experiences and emotions he was about to commit to paper had stayed with him all his life, in great part defining his personality and his beliefs. He now lived comfortably in a large house outside Morristown, New Jersey, surrounded by 27 acres of nature. With him was Gladys Buchanan North, his beloved wife and workmate of 35 years. He was an avid and knowledgeable naturalist, and a man who loved fishing almost as much as he felt compelled to write. In 1934, when he was 27 years old, his book Plowing on Sunday would be published, a romantic yet frank and earthy novel set in a somewhat fictional version of Edgerton he called Brailsford Junction. Here, he writes about a teenaged boy on the eve of World War I. To Peter Brailsford, impatient with his youth, torn with fear of God, of hell, and of sex, romantic, inexperienced, wistful, anxious to get ahead in the world, yet essentially unworldly, intolerant, rebellious, headstrong, filled with hatreds, jealousies, and a morbid interest in death, saddled with concepts of duty, patriotism, and courage, which were fatal to millions of his generation. Many of the characters in this book are only slightly disguised as fictional. Plowing on Sunday was well received by reviewers and the public, and it featured a jacket illustration by an up-and-coming artist named Grant Wood. But in Edgerton, it set off volleys of outrage, and perhaps some laughter behind closed doors. It was some years before a copy of the book could be found in the town's library. When we were little, we were lucky enough to have bedtime stories from my parents, and both of them often told us about their childhoods. And my very favorite was the one about the raccoon, Rascal, and washing a sugar cube. One morning, Young Sterling decided that Rascal was entitled to eat at the breakfast table. He brought his old high chair down from the attic and treated Rascal to a bowl of milk and a lump of sugar. And Rascal did what is instinct to every raccoon. He washed his meal before eating it. In a few moments, of course, it melted entirely away. He felt all over the bottom of the bowl to see if it dropped it. Finally, he looked at me and trilled a shrill question. Who had stolen his sugar lump? Rascal learned from his experiences, too. That was the last sugar lump he would try to wash. In fact, he soon learned where the treats were kept and began helping himself. Just as young Sterling was coming to know the world of nature, young Rascal began to explore the world of humans. Both were extremely curious and headstrong creatures, determined to find out what life was all about. The urge to explore and to stretch boundaries became a recurring theme in Sterling North's work. Oftentimes, he wrote about lives in transition, such as children approaching adulthood, or about how modest beginnings could lead to great achievements. His next book was Hurry, Spring, this was to be the first of a series on the magnificent and mysterious workings of nature throughout the seasons. But a series of strokes interrupted his writing. Once more, Sterling's overwhelming drive pushed him past the physical disabilities. It was to his history and his family he returned for his last book, The Wolfling. Published in 1969 to more awards and acclaim, Sterling wrote it while partially paralyzed, typing the entire manuscript with one finger. It's a novel about 
David Willard North's boyhood as a child of immigrants in Wisconsin. In it, Sterling celebrates his father in the natural world, but also the people who must inevitably try to conquer it. One warm and pleasant Saturday, young Sterling and Rascal ate breakfast together at the dining room table. They set off for a day of fishing and picnicking, but this Saturday was to be different. The boy who left the house that day had come to understand something greater than himself. As the day ended, Sterling, and a creature of nature he'd come to love, paddled towards Kashkanan Creek. Sterling gave his friend the final gift that he knew he must. Hearing the trill of a female raccoon, Rascal swam to the shore. With a last look towards Sterling, he disappeared into the woods. And so, a man who had come to know the thoughts of countless writers and historical figures throughout his career, released to the world the essence of his own life, told as the true story of a boy. The impulse to write, I believe, is the desire to communicate a memory, a mood, a distillation of delight that might otherwise be lost forever. It is mortal man's feeble attempt to stay the hand of time.